The Johnson Wax Program, Words at War, with Clifton Fadiman. makers of Johnson's Wax for home and industry in cooperation with the Council on Books in Wartime proudly present Words at War, bringing you another dramatization of an important war book. And here to introduce our program is one of the keenest judges of good books in America, Clifton Fadiman. Fadiman. Good evening. Tonight's dramatization is the next to the last in the current sponsored series of Words at War. In two weeks, your old friends Fibber McGee and Molly return to this spot on the dial. This evening, we present a thought-provoking program in this series which has dedicated itself to bringing you the opinions and the stories of writers who've had a close-up view of a world at war. But before our story, a word from Jack Costello. You know, friends, there are probably more good reasons today than ever before for taking proper care of the finish of your automobile. The older it gets, the more it tends to break down and even rust at vital spots. Secondly, one of these days you'll be ready for a trade-in, though that's still some way off. But it's certainly wise to keep the paint job in good condition, which you can do by occasionally cleaning and polishing your car with Johnson's Car New. One thing you like about Carnew is that it's relatively easy to use. Carnew both cleans and polishes with one application, two jobs at once. It's a liquid which dries on application to a powder. And when the powder is removed, it takes the dirt and road grime with it, leaving a satin smooth finish that's beautiful and easier to keep clean. I'm sure I don't need to add that you and your family will enjoy your car lots more when it's cleaned and polished. Remember, your dealer still has Johnson's Car New, spelled C-A-R-N-U. All right, Mr. Fadiman. We on Words at War are more than a little proud of the books which we've been able to dramatize for you. We feel that these books have shown how Americans have reacted to and have helped put down tyranny all over the world. We are proud of these stories which have told of Americans winning a war. You've seen the papers lately, mister? The papers say we're winning the war. Well, maybe they're talking about another war. I don't know. I'm talking about the war we're fighting to make this world a cleaner, safer, decenter place for us and our kids to live in. That the war you mean? Well, then I say we're losing that war. Sure, we've cracked the Siegfried line, but there are other battles that are important, too. I say we're losing them because our newspapers carry pictures of zoot suitors graduating from reform school to Sing Sing instead of from grammar school to high. We're losing the war because there are 14- and 15-year-old girls serving their vicious apprenticeship, picking up servicemen in bar rooms. I say we're losing because our slums are getting bigger instead of smaller, more numerous instead of fewer, more corrupt and disease-ridden and gang-run than the day the war started. These are battles we're losing, mister. And listen, there are pickets fighting with police and management fighting with labor and whites fighting with blacks and your dollar fighting with my dollar. And you say we're winning the war. Well, we're not. That's proof. We're losing. We're losing. We're losing. Sounds like a fanatic, doesn't he? Well, maybe he's excited, but he's not far wrong. No, those conditions do exist. And unless we're careful, those battles will be lost. And it doesn't take a fanatic to get excited about them either. A very cultured gentlewoman got excited about them too because she made a trip through America and saw them herself. So excited that she wrote a book about it. For she saw in these bitter battles a portent of evil for America's future. The lady is Mrs. Agnes E. Meyer. The book is Journey Through Chaos. It's a picture of America in a battle for its future and for its life. I saw the things our friend talks about. I saw race tensions in Detroit and slums in every city. I saw delinquency from Buffalo to San Francisco. Well, then why don't you get excited? Tell them about the shack cities and the packing box cities and the tent cities and the hovels of Pascagoula with one outhouse for ten families 
and the basement rooms of Detroit and Buffalo and Washington, D.C., with two families in a room and men sleeping in shifts. Tell them about the epidemics lying in wait, the crime that's born, the death that creeps out of those slums. Yes, I saw those things, too. And I asked, why must people live like that? Why must American harbor these slums, trusted around the factories like fungi around a tree trunk, poisonous and spreading, always spreading? Why must we tolerate these huge stew pots, cooking up race riots and disease, delinquency and crime? Why aren't these shack cities, these reeking slums, cleared out? Why aren't decent, livable homes built for these people? So I asked, and I got my answers. Ah, nuts. Most of these people are hillbillies. They've always lived that way. Don't you know there's a war on? There's no time, no materials to build homes for these people. Forget it. Some people are made for the slums. So spoke the careless ones. The unidentified mass of the people who don't think and don't care. But there were others who did identify themselves. Others who do think. And how. Madam, I'm a politician. But I've got my duty like anybody else. Why, if we build homes for those workers, you know what's going to happen. We're going to be left with a ghost town when the war's over. That'll mean lower real estate values. And lower real estate values mean less real estate taxes for the city treasury. And well, after all... How do you like that reason? You know any politicians who think like that? Well, maybe this next man is your neighbor. Look, I'm a regular resident of this town. If we build homes for these these outsiders, you know what's going to happen? The war will end and boom. They'll sit right in those houses and go on relief. That means more of a tax load on us old residents. I say leave the slums as they are, and when the war is over, those folks will go back where they belong. Go back where they belong. Uh-huh. And now your reason, Mr. Resident of Washington, D.C.? Well, uh, we know those ten-in-a-room alley slums are a disgrace to the capital of the United States, but we can't do a thing. If we start investigations, we would have to condemn most of these houses. And those evicted families would just move in with others and make it more crowded still. Or they'd sit in the street and say the district government was anti-this or anti-that. That's why we're leaving well enough alone. Well, how do you like that? And it's all true, I assure you. But wait, before you get too angry with those cynical people, let me tell you something else that's equally true. There are enlightened American communities that have tried to solve the slum problem. One of them is Mobile. In that town, they built a housing project, a settlement of comfortable, clean, airy homes for the factory slum dwellers. And when some of the slum families were offered these homes, well... Their answers were hard to believe. Ah, uh, why don't you leave us alone? But uh, don't you understand, sir? The government has built these homes for people just like yourselves. They're clean and nice, and you'll like living there. Don't want to move? Fact is, they ain't going to move. Please, uh, Mrs. Slocum, maybe you can make him see. Don't you want a cleaner place for you and your children? A real stove instead of this can of gasoline? No, oh, no, we don't want to move no place where they're going to stick their nose in our business. Oh, we know the law. We know they want us to move into them new houses so they can tell us what to do. But uh, that's not true. Look, uh, you just got to move. We know our rights. There's a free country. We don't have to move unless we want to, and we don't want to. Yes, sir, this is a free country. By gosh, I, if I ain't nothing else, I'm a free man. So go on, get out of here, let us alone. <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, really happened. Yes, they can refuse to move. Yes, they can live in squalor. It's their American right. And many of them intend to continue exercising that American right. These groups have banded together in war center slums because of zoning laws, because of excessive rents elsewhere, and often because conditions in our country have accustomed these people to that kind of life. And a single word lies at the root of the congestion problem. Can you guess what it is? Try to guess. It's an important word. I was aware of it again and again as I traveled through America, as I came face to face with the problems of delinquency and class antagonisms and labor management troubles. That one little word 
lies at the root of terrible problems which have erupted in Chicago and Detroit in cities unnumbered. And as the slums grow, so too do the other evils grow. Disease, class quarrels, and most deadly of all for America's tomorrow, delinquency. Delinquency. Ha! Maybe being a woman you haven't seen the call houses with the 14-year-old girls in them. Maybe you haven't seen the police lineups with 16-year-old zoot suitors up for rape and robbery and assault and car thievery. And how about the delinquency rates? Up 56%. And the roving gangs of razor club-toting youngsters on the streets of America. Somebody's to blame and somebody should pay. Yes, I decided someone was to blame and somebody should pay. But it looked to me as though the children would be the only ones to pay. Because when I started asking questions... I received a lot of same answers. We have to tend to our war jobs. We can't keep track of our kids. Give them a stretch in reform school. That'll straighten them out. Yeah. But most reform schools don't make better kids, just better criminals. Oh, nuts. We're busy. We're fighting a war. After all, kids will be kids. <laughs> So I stopped talking to fathers and mothers. And in Buffalo and Cleveland and Portland and Mobile, I heard new catchphrases like latchkey kids and victory girls. And I went to the people who had invented these words, the police and the newspapers and the agencies fighting delinquency. And they invited me to the places that spawned delinquency. And I even went with them on their inspection tour. Is, officer. That's one of the gang that beat up my son. Don't let him get away. He says he has to work. Hey, kid, we want to talk to you. Ah, uh, you ain't talking to me, cop. Oh, yes, I am. Come here. Let me alone. Come Let here. me alone. I'll mobilize you. I'll call my gang, you dirty copper. You, you see, you see, officer, he admits he has a gang. I know he's the one who beat up my son today because, look, he's wearing my son's watch chain. Ah, uh, uh, well, why should that pantyways have a watch chain and a watch? And we can't have them. And another thing, we'll show these guys from across the tracks that they can't kick us around no more. We take what we want now. We take what we want now. We take what we want now. Isn't that the birth cry of fascism? Or am I wrong? Maybe it'll be all right after the war when people are home more and out of the war factories and able to take care of their children. And then again, maybe they won't be able to wipe out the barroom mistakes of their errant girls. Yes, I was in a barroom, too, with a detective. <laughs> Hiya, baby. Have a drink on me? Sure. I'll take a stinger. Just a second, kid. How old are you? What's it to you? This badge is what's it to me. How old are you? None of your business. This is a free country. Well, suppose I guess 16. That'd make you too young to be in here. In fact, that would make you breaking the law. See, I didn't know how young she was, officer. I wasn't trying to pick her up. I only offered her a drink. I, I didn't... Uh, uh, I'll see you later. Hey, you behind that bar. I'm arresting you for selling liquor to a minor. Here's your summons. Hey, wait a minute. Do I have to ask for their birth certificate every time I sell a drink? Hey! All right, don't push. I'm coming. Can't a girl have a little fun in this town? Why don't you kids try having your fun at home? Home? That's dump. I haven't had a square meal or a clean bed since my old lady went to work in the aircraft factory. My neighborhood stinks. And my old man ain't been sober since Pearl Harbor. Besides, if I'm what you call a delinquent for hanging around these places, why ain't the older ones delinquent too? They run the jerks! There was the answer from the children themselves. Home wasn't worth going home to. And what's wrong with bar rooms and nightclubs if they're good enough for our folks? And I asked why there wasn't something done to take them out of the bar rooms, give the children places of their own, like playgrounds and canteens. And of course, there were more of those familiar replies. Well, of course, we'd like to build those things for the kids. But you find juvenile delinquency at its worst in war centers. And in a war center, we need the time and the space and materials for war work. First things first, I say. It's our patriotic duty. I see. And then there were merchants, too, who encouraged children to stay out of school by offering them jobs. 
they asked me. Can you blame me for trying to keep my business going? Help is so hard to get, I'll take anything. Yes, anything. Even the seeds of America's tomorrow. But those seeds are going rotten, and they promise a crop of crime and moral blindness and disease. A fine crop from which to harvest the leaders of tomorrow's brave new world, to guard us against any possible dictators of the future. And again, that one little word had cropped up. Have you guessed yet what it is? This is Clifton Fadiman. Johnson's Wax is bringing you an adaptation of Agnes E. Meyer's book, Journey Through Chaos. Perhaps many of you are shocked by the revelations made here. There are those who will say, and rightly, that there are bright spots in the picture, that there are cities which are pushing aside prejudice and self-interest to help stamp out the evils of borning in America. And they would be correct, Mr. Fadiman. There are such bright spots. I saw them, like oases in the deserts. But they had to fight the same little word that I asked our listeners to search for behind delinquency, behind congestion. The word that forms the basis for another American evil. Hatred of group for group. Class hatred. Now you're talking about a real headache. Why, there are ten cities in America right now just aching for race riots. Segregation and discrimination and pussyfooting politics. These things are dynamite, sister. And I tell you, in no time at all, they'll explode into death and destruction on a thousand peaceful streets in this country. And you know I'm afraid that much of what our ranting friend says is true. I know. I saw it. And so, again I asked questions, and again I got my answers. You've got to keep them in their place. Maybe. But is there a place the dirtiest slums in America? You can't do anything for these people. They've always lived like that. Sure, I know. You want us to live next door to them. And next you want us to move in with them. Give them an inch and they'll take a mile. That's right. How would they like to be over in Germany? Wait up, lady. Don't listen to those platitudes. Those half-truths and half-lies have poisoned America's thinking too long. Tell the listeners the truth. Tell them about the Jim Crow cars. Yes, and don't forget the taboos against Negroes voting in the South. And tell them how Germany and Japan sell the rest of the world on the story that our racial practices are exactly like theirs. And tell how colored races the world over believe it, because it's true. And while we're talking, let me tell you a story I heard today. Yes, yes, I've heard those stories. There are hundreds of such stories around. Some true, some half true. Some easily believe because they could be true. Yes, I've heard those stories. And I've seen Jim Crowism and segregation and discrimination. Stories about them have been around for years. But what actual good have they done toward solving our racial problem? Oh, there's no denying it. There is discrimination down south. There is injustice down south. But wait a minute, you northerners. Don't sit back and smirk complacently about your southern neighbors. I want to tell you something that will surprise you, and I'll defend and prove this statement at any court in the land. It is the South that is making the biggest strides toward the solution of the race prejudice problem, and the North that's making it in the opposite direction. I repeat, it is the South that is making the biggest strides toward the solution of the race prejudice problem, and the North that's moving in the opposite direction. Here's the kind of stuff you hear up north. Listen, if we let these guys get up at it, they'll soon be taking our jobs. That's why we keep them out of certain jobs. We've got to protect those jobs for us. We've got to keep them in their place. So, Mr. Northerner, look around you. The race prejudice problem is in your lap, and you're bungling it worse than the South ever did. And what is underneath it? The same word that caused the South's discrimination. I grew surer and surer of it as I neared the end of my trip. That one little word is the main reason for America's wartime trouble. It's the word which causes congestion to link itself with and give birth to juvenile delinquency, and which makes juvenile delinquency grow out of and at the same time promote race hatred. And then blanketing the whole, intertwined with, living side by side with those things, is the common fight 
the all-American fight, which goes on in the homes of Shacktown and Sugar Hill, the mining towns of Pennsylvania and the factories of the Midwest. Management versus labor. Now you're talking about the most serious problem we face today. Well, look at the strikes in this country. And look at the employers using the war effort as an excuse for standing at labor. And look at the petty squabbles and what happens to America's war effort while labor and management fight. There's absenteeism and broken contracts and refusal to arbitrate. And all together, one big mess. Now, wait a minute. You can't condemn either management or labor with a blanket indictment. But it's also true. You can't travel through the boom towns of America without finding the evidence of too many fights between management and labor. Here a picket line, there a closed shop. Headlines of accusations against both sides. Demands for a National Service Act. And of course we read about it and fail to realize it. As one intelligent leader said. The labor management problems and points of friction arising now would have taken 50 years to arise in the normal course of things. The war is telescope time and made minor things pile up on each other and so become more irritating and seem more serious. But there are few who recognize this. Few of the people I talk to, anyhow. There'll always be a fight between capital and labor. But perhaps if both labor and management realize that one cannot do without the other... Oh, go on. Labor is in the hands of the racketeers. Oh, nonsense. Most labor leaders are honest and conscientious. I tell you, industry isn't going to give an inch unless it has to. <laughs> as I investigated and asked more questions, I realized here that in labor management relations, the vicious little word was clearer than ever. The word at the root of the nation's trouble was a part of the policy of both sides. For instance, in a squabble between a Midwestern union and a war industry, an argument arose. All right, man. All you fellows with application cards okay, step over here for your physical examination. Uh, we're not taking any physicals, Jim. But it's new company policy. It's for your own good, you guys. Our union voted no, Jim. Well, boy, this is a good one. Physical examinations for your own good and your union turns them down? Why? Well, I know it sounds silly and the papers will probably eat it up, but we're standing our ground. What if your doctors find TB among some of the men, or cancer, or something else? Well, in that case, they shouldn't be working. You know that. They should be under a doctor's care. Sure, but what if they have no money for a doctor's care? And after the war, labor ain't so scarce, and industry can pick and choose. You think they're going to pick guys with TB and cancer and other stuff on their cards? No, brother. Sorry, we have to protect ourselves. The word again. They have to protect themselves from the word. It underlies every move of management and labor. Have you guessed the word? Then listen, and I'll tell you. It's fear. Fear. Fear of management for labor and labor for management. Fear of motives and fear of moves and fear of unemployment and fear of poverty. Congestion and delinquency, class hatred and the conflict between labor and management intertwined and inseparable, and underlying them all, one emotion, fear. Do you think we want to live in the slums? Well, some folks who call themselves decent would probably mow us down if we tried to move into their pretty neighborhoods. If we let them move in from the slums, they'll be left on relief rolls when the war is over. They'll push property values down. They'll ruin us. Fear, mutual fear on both sides of the railroad track. Oh, I want to take care of my kids, right? But I've got a job in a war factory. Oh, it's the first time my family's been able to earn a decent living, and I can't give it up. Fear of tomorrow in a million mothers' hearts. A willingness to take a chance with a child's fate just to earn a few dollars to put the family an extra jump ahead of the landlord or the butcher. Yeah, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. We gotta protect our jobs from them, cause I hear they'll work for nothing. We gotta keep them in their place. Fear based on the color of the skin. Fear that the white man will try to take back the freedom won in wartime. Fear that the Negro will try to keep it. Fear of man for man. Why should we workers give up privileges when our boys are fighting a war to preserve those privileges? That doesn't make sense. Why should we let these union men walk in and tell us how to run our business? It's our business, our money. We want to run it our way. So 
there is the picture I saw of America blocked and twisted by fear. People move or won't move because of fear. And they leave their jobs or won't leave their jobs because of fear. And they won't give in or won't give up because of that word, fear. And now, Mrs. Meyer, can you tell us the answer to fear in America? Yes, Mr. Fadiman. We can conquer anything in this country of ours if our hearts and minds are in the job. Look at the Army's magnificent victories. How do they do it? By teamwork. There's good teamwork in Cleveland and Oregon and Springfield, Mass., and in Wichita, too, and other cities as well. And there are industries that have never had a strike. Yet these islands of progress are set in an ocean of fear that cripples and retards progress the country over. And the future is shrouded in uncertainty. But teamwork and reason and understanding will banish that fear. Teamwork. Working together. The fighting of fear by each individual American as he comes into contact with the problems which confront him. Those are the things which will wipe fear from the lexicon of freedom forever. Well, Americans, you've heard another Words at War program, and while it's fresh in your mind, I'd like the privilege of adding a footnote. Like our other Words at War dramatizations, it's handled some pretty touchy stuff. It's pointed out things that some of us all too often are inclined to hush up. Don't talk about such things, we say. Keep quiet about them, and maybe they'll go away. But when we do that, we're like the man who continues to sit on a keg of TNT, hoping desperately that it won't blow up, or at least that it won't blow up soon. Well, the thing to do when you're forced to sit on a powder keg is to empty the powder out of it, and you can't do that by wishing. You've got to act. So don't stop with just applauding outspoken programs like Words at War. Read the books we dramatize. And then, when you're fully informed, add your might as an independent citizen to the effort now being made to make America a nation at which no foreign propagandist can point the finger of scorn. Thank you. Mr. Fadiman will be back in just a moment to tell us about next week's show. But first, with summer officially gone, you'll be spending more time indoors, and your household problems will change a little. But there's one room where traffic never seems to let up, and that's your kitchen. Its linoleum floor surfaces come in for pretty hard wear, and they really need to be protected. They need the kind of care you can give them so easily with Johnson's self-polishing glow coat. If you protect them regularly with glow coat, they'll last six to ten times longer. In addition, they'll always look bright and cheerful and sparkling, and their colors will endure. It takes very little effort to achieve these results, Because glow coat is self-polishing, it needs no rubbing or buffing. You simply apply glow coat and let it dry. If you're a regular glow coat user, you know what conservation means. If you're not, try Johnson's self-polishing glow coat this week, especially on your linoleum and asphalt tile floor coverings. And now what about next week's show, Mr. Fadiman? Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we bring you a book with one of the most beautiful titles I've ever heard, Joseph Driscoll's Pacific Victory, 1945. About the only thing to make the title more beautiful than it is would be to change the date to 1944. 1945. About the only thing to make the title more beautiful than it is would be to change the date to 1944. Now, this is Clifton Fadiman inviting you to join us again next week when we bring you Pacific Victory, 1945. Tonight's dramatization of Journey Through Chaos was written by Peter Hawkins and featured Kay Strozzi. The production was directed by Anton Leder. Music was composed and conducted by Morris Momorski. Next week, the Johnson Wax Company brings you another in the series, Words at War, featuring another great wartime book, Pacific Victory 1945. Jack Costello speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company.